I'm Rusty Dornan from the Kaufman Fellows Academy, and you can't see me, but you can hear me. Uh, I'm here with Clint Corver, who you, you can see on the screen. He's the COO of NovoEd, but more importantly, really, he's the co-instructor of Venture Deals, Startup CEO, and several other courses within KFA. He's also the co-founder of the Kaufman Fellows Academy, a serial investor, and an adjunct professor at Stanford. Thanks for joining us, Clint. It's exciting to have you be part of the Venture Deals course. Let's go ahead and just jump right in. Well, let's go ahead and just jump right in for the questions since we can only, you've been sitting there for a while already. <clears throat> Would you recommend establishing founder revesting, re-earning proactively in anticipation of the investor request? I think it's fair that a significant portion of your stock, 25 to 50%, should be considered vested in recognition of your efforts to date. All right, so there's a couple of elements to that question. I guess the first thing I would focus on as an entrepreneur is do what you need to build the business. And so in my mind, you know, that is not necessarily making investors happy. That's a separate. But if revesting you think is what the basically the team needs in order to, for them to stay committed for the long time, by all means do that. But this is about building the business. It's not making the investors happy. Now, when the investors come in, they're going to have requests for you. And typically investors, especially early stage investors, uh, want to um, see that the founders are committed for the long term. And typically they'll give you a little credit for time served, so to speak, but it can be you can be at the company for a year or you can be there for five years. And typically investors will only give you about 25% of your stock as vested stock. Now, the rationale from the investor's point of view is they don't know you and they don't know how committed you're going to be to the long-term success of the company. And a startup company is going through ups and downs. It's actually a really hard endeavor. So vesting is one way that you can signal to investors that you're serious about being committed to the company. Now, you know that as an entrepreneur, that this is your baby and there's no way you're going to leave that. But that's a hard message to communicate effectively to investors because everybody says that. So vesting is the concrete way that you signal to investors that you're in it for the long term. Okay. Uh, next question, from an entrepreneur's perspective, how comprehensive should the term sheet be? Would you recommend focusing primarily on the big four issues, namely valuation price, liquidation preference, vesting, and board structure composition? Well, well, first of all, a term sheet is not a legal document. A term sheet is just there to facilitate the expectation setting between the entrepreneur and the investor. So I would argue you put everything in the term sheet, where it's important to have a set of expectations about before you hand it to the attorneys. So, I mean, certainly the items that you list should be in the term sheet. And the, the key here, by the way, is actually to get a really good attorney. So a good attorney who's done this before can sort of walk you through the other issues. And they say, well, do you care about um, stock repurchase rights or your ability to go sell your stock? And there's going to be, going to be a whole bunch of like, call it sort of like minor issues that will probably not be such a big deal but you never know. And so it's good to kind of go through the list. And if it's important, you should make sure it's on the term sheet. By, by the way, the investors are going to have a bunch of issues that they really care about. So for example, pro rata rights. So if I own 20% of the company for my Series A investment, I may want to make sure that I can always buy 20% of all future investments. And this is really important for a lot of VCs business models. So they're going to have a handful of things like that that they're going to want to put into the term sheet. And again, it's not a legal document. It's just to make sure that you as an entrepreneur understand what's important to the VCs. Now, all the action then happens when that term sheet can, can, can gets converted into legal documents. So one of the risks of having a really small term sheet is that something surprising shows up in the legal documents and then it becomes a much more expensive and time-consuming process to renegotiate because you're doing it through lawyers, you're not just doing it VC to entrepreneur. We have a follow-up question with that and how much should you fight about a term sheet if it's not binding? How much should you leave for afterwards? How detailed should you be? Well, you know, it's a I guess it depends on who you're interacting with. So if you're interacting with a professional VC who does this day in and day out, then I would have like all the arguments up front because they kind of understand what's going to happen and it's a it's just a more it's a much more efficient way to have the conversations. It's it's not like um, if you kind of avoid a hard conversation, it's somehow going to get easier later on. It's not going to get any easier later on. Now 
The one exception to that is if you're dealing with investors who don't really understand the whole investing process and it's kind of the standard terms. And then they might, you know, it's, it's, now it's kind of a delicate dance because these folks, like let's, let's say you're raising angel funding and you're, as the entrepreneur, putting the term sheet together and trying to pull in a bunch of angel investors who may not be quite as experienced with this. So then there can be an argument for taking some of that, if you will, the detail and pushing it back into the legal documents and essentially building their commitment um, you know, through the term sheet, through the first couple of phases of the legal documentation, and then you know, if they run into some other issues, there's kind of this sunk cost mentality. Well, I'm already in it. There's all these other investors in it, so I'm going to continue. There's some risk associated with that, uh, so you got to kind of figure out who you're managing. But like I said, professional folks, I do it all up front with the angels and the artist professional. You know, you just got to gauge the relationship and try to figure out you know when's the right time. Okay, any tips on negotiating terms with customers, assuming they are interested in providing seed funding? Ooh, so seed funding from customers is a, um, you know, it sounds a lot better than it really is. So first of all, seed funding doesn't count as revenue. So for other investors' point of view and so forth, that kind of doesn't count the same sort of way. And if a, if a customer is actually willing to invest in you, I would work hard to try convert that into them buying your product or service. So it's now revenue as opposed to an investment. And by the way, it's fine to say, hey, look, you know, if you're going to you know, buy a lot of our product and service and you're an early customer and writing a big check, we'll give you a really special deal, special services, special terms, and these sort of things. So I would work really hard to convert their interest in equity into more of a standard business relationship. Now, if they're really hardcore about it and they really want to invest, I'd say that the safest thing for you as an entrepreneur is to have other professional investors at the table at the same time. So typically, customers are considered strategic investors, which means they're not as, con I mean, in it, well, in addition to wanting a financial return, they've got other business drivers, namely building their business, that they're trying to optimize for. And this, for a lot of big companies in particular, is more important to them than getting a financial return. So that their desire to build their own business could show up in strange incentives for you. So for example, they might not want you selling to their competitors. So that's why, so, so in particular, if they invest, they have some control, but if they're on the, your board, they have even more control. And so you want to balance that out, like I said, with professional investors who have a financial interest primarily. Okay. How to sweeten the deal for angel investor the less expensive way? How do you do that? Given convertible note with two million cap, 25% discount, A, decrease cap, B, increase discount, C, add warrant coverage, D, add MFN clause. Okay, so no MFN clause <laughs> if you can avoid it. So that you just don't know where your company is going to go, and that's almost always a problem. Um, so avoid MFN calls also with customers if you can. So in terms of the other things on there, I'd say I wouldn't put warrant coverage. So for it just makes things complicated. And it's a, basically warrant coverage is just another way to discount price. Um, likewise, uh, discount and caps are other ways to discount price. So, so my recommendation when dealing with angels is to keep it absolutely as simple as possible. And so really the, the only two things you're negotiating are cap and the discount. And, you know, I guess what I'd say is, um, well, there's a couple of things. So one is you can basically, uh, most people, if they want to invest, well, they, well, I guess, here's the thing. If they're willing to invest, but at a lower cap, you can, you can offer, you can make the, you can ask them for the offer. And there's, you can do things which says, okay, well, any money that comes in, call it today, for the next 30 days is going to get the lower cap, say a million and a half cap. And then after that 30 days, the cap's going to go up. So I don't really like this quite so much just personally. I like all the investors to have the same set of terms when they show up. But that's one way that you can sort of finesse it, which is the very first money in is more valuable than, so let's say you're raising half a million dollars. The first $100,000 of that half million is a lot more valuable than the last 100000 And there's actually a school of thought and a, and a number of folks who recommend doing it that way. So I don't, but you got to do what you got to do to get the money in. Okay. VCs always ask, what valuation are you putting on your company? How should an entrepreneur answer that question? 
All right, so, so this is a tricky question, obviously, and I'd say the best way to answer it is with comparables. So if you say, well, you know, we kind of look like these three other companies in the marketplace that just got VC funding, and they all got valuations around $10 million. So, so that kind of like anchors you. And then the question is, well, how good are you compared to these three companies that just got the $10 million valuation? And you might say, well, you know, look, we've got more traction in the market. We've got a better team, so our valuation should be higher. Or you might be that, you know, hey, you know, we're not quite as far along with these folks. You know, so they got $10 million, so maybe a little bit less. So it's a, um, so I would typically kind of do it like that where, and, and the goal, by the way, is you just want a fair price. So you're not looking to get as much as possible. You want this to be a long-term relationship. And, I mean, these are what VCs want to hear. That uh, you know you're not you're not in this for the transaction of getting the most possible out of this deal. You're in it for the long-term relationship to build a company that's as valuable as possible. Okay. Should founders issue preferred stock to themselves? In which cases is it worth considering? So, preferred stock to founders is worth considering in my mind when you're writing a check alongside other investors at the same valuation as other investors. So this is tip, actually this often happens if there's a successful entrepreneur who's you know built a billion dollar company and now they start another company you know they may write a check for five million dollars to get the company off the ground or maybe they write a check for two and a half million dollars and then a VC writes a check for two and a half million dollars. So in those circumstances it's absolutely appropriate for in the founders to be getting preferred stock. Other than writing a check, and like I said, writing a check where there's a market price with another investor, I think it just makes things more complicated than it needs to be. And so if you write, if you give yourself preferred shares really early on, it's just frankly a mess that the next professional investor is going to have to clean up. Okay. In your opinion, what is the best overall strategy for keeping the founders or common shareholders close to participation in the proceeds of a sale? I assume not raising any VC money at all? Well, so certainly if you raise no outside money and you sell the company, then the common shareholders get all of it. So that's, you know, certainly the cleanest. Now, Practically, so if you're, let's, let's say you've raised VC money. So then the question is, well, how do the founders and the employees get compensation when it's a small sale? And there's this liquidation process. So let's say there's, you raise $10 million in VC funding. They have a $10 million liquidation preference. So they get the first $10 million back from any sale. And now somebody comes along and offers you $9 million to buy your company. So not quite what you wanted, but, you know, you're not, your prospects for building a bigger company really aren't that exciting. And so now it's like, well, $9 million makes sense for a sale, but you're going to give 100% away to the VC. So that makes no sense at all from the management point of view. Typically what will happen then is they'll do what they call a carve-out. So they'll say, well, let's take a certain chunk of this $9 million. Maybe we'll take $2 million, and we'll set it aside. And that is set aside for, as a signing bonus to people that continue on with the acquiring company. Or maybe that's a retention bonus. So if, if you're there with the acquiring company for a year, then you get these payoffs. So essentially, it's a negotiation at that time because the, at least the professional investors, they all get that there's no incentive for management to sell the company if they get no proceeds out of it. Okay. What drives crazy valuations such as for Snapchat? I feel that Snapchat has a 99 story, crazy high valuation, crazy large funding around, but no revenue and no plan for how to generate it. How come? Well, so how come is Facebook... Twitter, LinkedIn, and a bunch of companies that made investors tons of money with really no business model at the time they were raising their early early rounds. And so the so yeah, I mean it's got flavors of 99 to it, but there's a big difference actually. So in 99 it was all about quote unquote eyeballs and it was the number of folks you could sign up. But they it was there wasn't nearly call it the sophistication or attention paid to engagement. So one of the things that makes Facebook so amazing is not just that they've got a billion people that show up. It's like half of their users show up every day. So it's that level of engagement. By the way, same with Snapchat. So Snapchat has a ton of users, but more importantly, they've got a ton of users that show up every single day and many times a day. So it's that level of engagement now that basically has really grabbed people's attention. And it's grabbed people's attention, like I said, because billion-dollar companies have been built that follow this pattern.
Okay, another example, Medium. The startup raised $25 million in its Series A. Do such overheated valuations mainly depend on experience of the team, innovation of the idea, valuation of similar companies, growth prospects, or total size of the market? Yeah, well, first of all, when you say a Series A, it can mean a lot of different things. So in Medium's case, for example, um, that was a company started by Ev Williams, the founder of Twitter, and, you know, it's kind of not publicly known, but uh, how much he put in, but he basically wrote the check himself. He's a billionaire, so he wrote the check himself for the first few rounds of funding. So their Series A is probably more like a Series C compared to most companies. And then the other thing that kind of goes into valuation, not kind of, does go into valuation, it's not just the stage of the company, so they're probably, like I said, more, more advanced than typical Series A, but it's like, who's running it? So, okay, this guy built a billion-dollar company. So he's going to get a lot of credit for that when he starts his next company. And then there's the standard stuff, you know, size of the market, the quality of the rest of the team, are there any differentiated, what are the key differentiators, and are they protectable and that sort of thing. But in Medium's case, I think it's primarily those first two, which is Ed Williams wrote a bunch of checks to begin with, and he built a billion-dollar company. So I'd, okay. I'd argue in that case it's, it's really not such a high valuation, perhaps. You've been on both sides of the table as an entrepreneur and, of course, as an investor. Do you do you, people tend to get a hung up on certain things in the term sheets that don't really matter, and how can you avoid that? Yeah, so the um, there's a couple of things that really, I guess, I guess first-time entrepreneurs really get stuck on, for example. So one is vesting, and the sense that, you know, I, as a first-time entrepreneur, run into a VC and they say, great, I want to invest in your company, but you're going to have to vest your stock over four years. And the typical first-time entrepreneur is worried about, oh, does that mean you're going to give me the money, you're going to fire me the next day, and then I lose the company. And, and that's the reason that's like a real hard sticking point is because it's not really a logic-based argument. It's a, more of an emotional-based argument for the entrepreneurs. It's like their baby and there's a chance that somebody else is going to have control of their baby. And I'd say, you know, frankly, that's just the deal that comes along with having outside investors, an outside board, and frankly, even employees. As soon as other people get involved in your company, you're now giving up some control over that. Now, from a, from a venture person's point of view, the last thing in the world they want is for the entrepreneur to leave the company. So they're, you know, desperately, frankly, desperately hoping that they never have to fire the entrepreneur because the entrepreneur is so much of what makes a company a company early on. So it's, uh, and, and, there are some, and there are some investors, by the way, that because the entrepreneur is so important, if they're going to be emotionally driven around things like vesting and they can't get their ego and their pride out of the way to think about what it's really going to take to build a business, you know, that alone can disqualify entrepreneurs from a VC's point of view. And there's some VCs that will even, like Ron Conway, who's a very successful angel investor, is, is very kind of blunt about this kind of stuff. It's like, if you even like, if you even start to negotiate that, I'm done. I'm out of here. And he's got a couple of issues like that, but founder vesting is one of the hot buttons. He's got a standard way I'm doing it. If you don't like the way I do it, don't come to me asking for funding. Is there a way to avoid or minimize dilution for existing team members as new funding comes in? Sure, there's a number of ways to uh, manage that. Well, first of all, I would try and manage expectations with your team members that dilution is going to happen. And in fact, most people dramatically underestimate the amount of dilution that happens between being a seed company and going public. So just to give you the, the, some of the numbers that I've seen, so not like, you know, I wouldn't call these kind of industry averages, but just things that I've seen, it's not uncommon to only own 20 to 30 percent of the percentage share at IPO that you got at the seed stage. So if you got, say, 5% of the company at the seed stage, it's not uncommon to only have 1% at the time that it goes public. And by the way, this is good news, because when you're, it's the whole notion is your, your share of the pie is shrinking, but the pie is growing dramatically faster than the share that mm -hmm. is shrinking. shrinking. So, so that's called it the standard story. Now, there are some, I call it minor things you can do along the way. So once people have um, earned some of their vesting, you can re-up their stock. By the way, when they get promoted, so you go from a director to a vice president, then you can give them more stock. Typically, both those additional stock amounts are less than what they'd get up front, but it's 
you know, a, a lot of this is basically the story that people tell themselves. And so, so long as they can tell them story, themselves a story of growth, like, you know, my pie is getting bigger even though my, my share is getting smaller. Oh, and here's some new stock that comes in. I find that works for most employees. Okay. Ideally, after the pitch presentation, the VC would say, we'll send you a term sheet in a few days. In reality, what is the normal evolution of the dating process to get a term sheet? Okay, so, so, so there's like multiple paths on here. So there's the unicorn kind of company where that happens. You go do a pitch, and basically a few days later, you get a term sheet. Now, a lot happens under the covers. This doesn't happen accidentally. So in addition to the pitch, there's often the story that, oh, and I'm talking to five other folks, and I'm also talking to Sequoia and Benchmark and Excel and, you know, some really big name firms, and somebody's making a phone call and they find out their buddy at Sequoia is actually really interested. So it's usually competitive pressures that drive getting a term sheet really quickly. Like I said, that doesn't happen very often. The more common path is you go have a conversation with them and they say, oh, that's kind of interesting. By the way, this is the common success path, okay? There's, the most common path is you have a conversation and nothing happens. But the su common success path is you have a first conversation. They say, oh, that's interesting. Let me bring you in to talk to one of my other partners. So then you come in and do exactly the same pitch but to two partners. Then they do some due diligence. They come out and talk to you. You know, maybe like a month goes by where they're kicking things around. And then they bring you into the full partner meeting. So the full partner meeting is just kind of what it sounds like. All the partners in the firm are there, typically happens on a Monday morning, and it's only after the full partner meeting pitch do they give you a term sheet. And by the way, in that full partner meeting, at this point in time, your partner that you were initially talking to, they are now your individual champion inside the firm. And so their challenge is, well, how do I sell your company in my firm? And if they're good, they'll actually work with you on that. They might, they'll say, it's like, well, look, you know, I've got this old school guy over here and he really needs to see the business model and you don't have one yet so we need to work on a you know some way that to get him comfortable that you'll be able to figure out your business model so I'd say like the really good uh, VCs that are experienced will actually help manage help you manage the process internally and then once you get the term sheet by the way it's still 30 to 45 days before you get the cash in the bank because you negotiate the term sheet it's converted into do legal documents there's back and forth with that and then you get money. So soup to nuts, from an entrepreneur's point of view, like with Novoid, you know, I would plan, call it four months for a typical VC process, uh, and that's assuming that it goes well. And so you, you assume that it's not going to go well in a couple of spots. You know, six months is probably a better buffer, a better, better sort of estimate estimation of what a typical VC process looks like. And by the way, this I'm, I'm thinking I'm talking early earlier stage here, so. Seed, Series A, Series B. Once you get into the later rounds, it goes much more quickly, but you've already got the relationships, and so you're calling up people that you know um, to get these rounds. So that's kind of a different animal. It, it sort of underscores also, don't wait till the last minute uh, till you have very little runway, because it does take time. It takes months often, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't want to get in a situation where you f you're appearing desperate, right? Right. Now, now you... you, you in terms of like managing this process, so I'm a big fan of talking to VCs long before you need any of their capital. And I think a great question for them is when you're talking to them early on, say, you know, I'm not raising any money right now, but I'd really like to know what we would have to accomplish for you to be excited about talking about an investment. And, and by the way, if they answer that question, they say, well, I really need to see that you've got three paying customers and a VP of engineering. Well, that's basically an invitation to go back to them now and say, you know, call them up three months later and, hey, I've got three paying customers and a VP of engineering. Let's talk. Okay. But yeah, but this is a relationship. This is a, a long period, long-term period kind of thing. Okay. With which VCs did you like co-investing most if you have any experiences here? I don't know if you're comfortable answering that. Uh, sure. I mean, so, so we've co-invested with a lot of VCs. Um, you know, I guess, you know, Sequoia, we've co-invested with now five different times, and they're great in part because they're Sequoia. So if you get an investment from Sequoia, everybody knows who they are. It makes it recruiting that much easier, and, and Sequoia's got this whole thing just wired, this whole startup thing. Now, by the way, you know, that's like, in my mind, the hardest thing, to, the hardest VC to go get funding from. So um, other VCs that I think are sort of more approachable in some ways, like 
they're Costa Noa Ventures. So they're uh, so there's a guy Greg Sands who spun out of Sutter Hill, and he was our primary backer at Novoed, and I had co-invested with him a number of times before Novoed, and he's kind of like what you want a VC to be in the sense of hands-on, really helps out. And by the way, the way, way we did our funding at Novoed is in the seed round we took small amounts of money from five different VC firms, Costa Noa being one. And then we had basically nine months to a year to work with each of these folks, kind of in a, they had an official relationship, but it was a low-key relationship. None of these folks were on the board. And of these, all these investments, Costa Noa was the most helpful. And so we went around for our Series A, they were top of our list. So you know, I guess that's one thing I'd say where, uh, another thing, which is who you work with in a VC firm like the individual partner is more important than the VC firm itself. And the more, the more ex information you can get about that individual partner and better yet experience with that individual partner, the better you're going to be able to make that decision. Okay. What are the strategies to determine an appropriate size for the employee options pool? Well, so there, there are some rules of thumb on this, so you don't have to think too hard about this. I guess, you know, especially if you're raising funding, um, VCs will have their point of view about what that pool needs to be. And so if you're like in a sort of a seed round, sometimes, by the way, sometimes in seed round you can get away with no pool. If you're just doing convertible notes, you, you don't have to create a pool because of investors. And then the standard strategy is to think about, well, what are all the equity needs I have between where I am right now and the next round of funding? And so let's say you're the seed, you know, you've got a year to go before the Series A, and you say, I need to hire three engineers, a product manager, and a sales guy. And that's going to take 5% equity, say. So then I think from an option pool point of view, maybe you get, create a 10% option pool. Give yourself a little buffer in case somebody comes along you weren't expecting. And you sort of keep the option pool smallish. Um, you don't have to, but uh, I think, you know, sort of, that's typically the way I've done it. You keep the option pool maybe twice what you think it's going to need, which is still kind of smallish. And then when the next VCs come in, they're going to, you're going to have the conversation, well, who do you need to hire now? And what other forms of equity are you going to need in order to like consultants or things like that in order to get to that next fundable milestone? And you have a negotiation around that, and out it's going to fall an option pool 10%, 20%, 5%. Okay. If and when are term sheets negotiable? Always negotiable. They're always negotiable. Um, then the question is, um, sort of, how are you smart about how you negotiate it? And I'd say that the easiest and best way to negotiate a term sheet is to have another term sheet. So basically, if you can lose the current term sheet because you know the other side walks away and you're okay with that because you've got a plan B, you're in a great position to go do this. Oops, sorry, turn that down. So you're in a great position to do negotiation. If you don't have a plan B, you know, then it's a your sort of your ability to negotiate with a from a position of strength obviously is not nearly as good. Um, and then you got to pick your battles. And so, find typically the best way to pick your battles is understand what the VCs really want. And typically, they're driven by like financial metrics, for example. And so there can be non-financial things that are typically easier to negotiate than the financial things. And on the financial things, everything comes down to valuation. So the size of the option pool, um, any kind of carve-outs, any kind of sort of financial terms, at the end of the day, it's just another way to talk about valuation. So from my point of view, I like to try to keep the term sheets as vanilla as possible and then just negotiate the uh, valuation just to kind of keep things simple. Okay. Um, not sure if I quite understand the last part of this question, but okay, a lot of us are probably beyond this and already have products up and running. What are some ways to make up for lost time? How do you introduce a product is live? How do you? I'm not quite sure what she means by that. Um, mm. Maybe if Sarah can go ahead and just um, answer that a little bit again. Um, I'm not sure that that. Are you clear on that? So not really. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure either. I mean, so so just to riff off that a little bit, I guess there's not really a making up time. I think kind of in the startup world, in the sense, you know, whether whether it took you four years or four months to get to where you are, 
I mean, that's where you are. And, you know, wherever you are, you want to be, you know, working absolutely as hard as you can to build your company from that point. So I, it's not like I'd recommend working harder if your first product wasn't successful than if your product, first product was successful. I mean, you need to be busting your butt, basically, re regardless of how you got to where you are. So I don't know if that helps or not, or answers the question. Okay, we have a, uh, it's 11.30, but we have a few more questions. Do you have a few more minutes? Yeah, I can go just a couple more minutes. Okay. In practice, can you also have two seed rounds to kick things off? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you, can, you can have as many seed rounds as, uh, as it takes. And I think there's, this is an interesting strategy from a couple of points of view. So um, there's a cosmetic view, if you will, of like a Series A. So Series A sounds like the very kind of first professional round, at least. And VCs like to tell themselves that story. And so if you're doing some multiple seed rounds, you can do, well, there's seed round one, there's seed two, there's seed three. And you just kind of label them differently. I mean, the lawyers don't care. They can put any label you want for the round in the documents. And so, and some people will also do this in later stages. They'll do like a Series C. We just had one of our companies, by the way, that just did a Series C one. So they did a Series C a year ago, and you know, a Series they didn't quite make the amount of progress or get the valuation they wanted for a Series D. So they just called it a Series C one to make it seem like you know they're well, we're a Series C company, and our expectations should be about a Series C, not about a Series D. So that's all cosmetic. Do whatever you want with that. I'd say in terms of the actually managing the investors, that's the harder bit in the sense of, okay, I've done a seed round and I haven't quite made enough progress in the company to be a Series A company. Well, are, there, are my investors going to believe enough in me that I can do it this time if I didn't do it the first time? So I think that's the bigger issue, which is you being able to convince your investors that you didn't hit your milestones the first time, but you can do it this time. Any recommendations for organic food sector consumer product VCs? Oh, not not really my area of expertise. Don't have much there. Sorry. Okay. Any tips? We you talked about this a little bit, but uh, another any tips to negotiate terms in the case of a customer making an early stage seed investment? Yeah, well, like I said, so tip one is to get them off a seed investment and onto buying your product or service. Um, you know, I guess the if you can't do that, the, the second thing I do is don't negotiate terms with a customer. I mean, they're typically not in the know. I mean, e even the intels of the world that have been doing VC for so have been doing VC for 20 years, they've got a different set of motivations, and so their valuations may not be kind of connected to market. And so my recommendation would do do a convertible note with no cap, or you basically do a, you say we'll do a convertible note and once we get a professional investor in there we're going to convert your note into whatever terms that they get which is essentially a convertible note with no cap but the next investor might be a convertible note as well and so you it's it's a little bit um, kind of a broader sort of notion but but basically just say hey look love your support not going to negotiate terms with you because I want to make sure I get market terms according to Sand Hill Road and or my you know other investors out there and you know I'm quite a not not quite there yet now by the way if you are there and you're taking investments from other folks and you've negotiated the terms you know then you can basically bring them along in the same terms and you ha you don't run into saying that you know that same issue of coming up with funky terms for a customer because you didn't know your market value. Clint, thank you so much for joining us, and our apologies. My camera is not working. That teaches me to do an upgrade right before I hang out. But, Clint, thanks so much. It's always great to have you. You answer questions directly, succinctly, and if folks are ever interested next year, Clint is also teaches his own course, course called Raising Startup Capital and in the future, VC 101. So um, stay tuned for that. Clint, once again, thanks for joining us. Next week we'll have Brad Feld on Tuesday talking about negotiations. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.